up on the screen, so, uh, Proverbs chapter, I almost said Solomon chapter 1. It was written by Solomon. Proverbs chapter 1, uh, some of you might remember, I've mentioned this a few times, several years ago, God led me uh, through a series of circumstances, was having some, having a little bit of trouble in the church, back when we had a school and a daycare, and I wasn't really sure of the source of the trouble, and so... Um, I prayed about it. God said, I want you to read Proverbs. So I did. And uh, read all 31 chapters. I got done, closed the Bible, and I said, God, that was really good. I have no idea what you wanted in that, but it was good. I, I, I learned some things. And so God said, read it again. So I commenced to reading it again. I started at... Proverbs 1, and read all the way through, and um, I said, I'm still not getting it. God said, read it again. And the third time is when I started picking up on this. And I've mentioned this before, but um, the other day, and by the way, I'm having trouble with uploading the sermon audio. I don't know what the problem is, uh, but I've made several attempts at uploading Thursday's Pastor Mike online uh, to um, Sermon Audio. I finally got the audio version of it there, but I haven't made it with the video yet, so bear with me. But I started a study uh, Thursday on the two women that you see in the book of Proverbs. There is one, uh, she, is, she is called Wisdom in Proverbs chapter 8. She's referred to in Proverbs chapter 31 as the virtuous woman who could find a virtuous woman. And uh, you see her mentioned in a, in a, if you see a woman in Proverbs mentioned in a positive way, in a positive light, then that's who you're dealing with. You're dealing with that virtuous woman. Uh, she is clean. She is holy. She's wise. In fact, she is wisdom. And uh, Proverbs chapter 8 says that, you know, that God through her uh, is the one who laid the foundations of the earth and he did all of those things. And um, uh, that, uh, that anybody who follows her and will listen to her, she's, she's crying out in the streets. She's telling people as they go by, why don't you listen to me? And in that I see... Uh, it, it could be this church or another Bible preaching, Bible believing church. But I'll just say this church. This church is, is opened up to anybody who is seeking God's wisdom. We want to be able to give it to them. To share what it is that God has blessed us with. To give us and to teach us the things uh, that God has taught us. To be able to teach the people Going up and down this street, I don't know if you've noticed in the last couple of years, this little area of Festus is starting to get pretty busy. New buildings going up, housing going up. That means more people living on this part of town that will be introduced to our church, if nothing more than that's the church they pass every day as they're going someplace else. You never know, but what somebody's going to, as they pass this place one day, they're going to say, you know what, I'm going to pull in there and see what kind of church that is. And uh, I was told this the other day uh, uh, by Brother Mike Hutzel. He's aware of it. I'm aware of it. There are, and it's not just a thing here in America. It's that way in Kenya, too, and probably that way in other places. People are sick and tired of Cookies and ice cream and Kool-Aid churches. Know what I mean by that? They're just giving them sweet things. They're giving them night. They're, they're doing what you would do with children to get them to come back to vacation Bible school or to get them to come back to Sunday school the next Sunday. You give them cookies, you give them a little ice cream, give them popcorn, give them all kinds of snacks and treats and do little puppet plays for them. Get them to laugh and get them to like it so they'll come back next Sunday. And people who have real problems, 
They're going to these churches. They're finding that there are no answers to their problems. And they're saying, is there a place? Is there a church that has the real answers to the problems that I'm facing? And I'm not saying that I've got anything. But I tell you what, I've got the thing that has everything. That is the word of God. And so uh, as part of that, I got to thinking about it this morning. And uh, the focus of what I was starting on uh, uh, Thursday has everything to do with what Father's Day is all about. Let's start reading in Proverbs chapter 1. And uh, uh, I, tried to, um, I tried to purposely uh, whittle down my notes a little bit. It was very difficult, to say the least. But I'll do, what I, do the best I can. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 1. Are you ready? Say amen. The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel. Remember that Solomon was the wisest man ever lived. God endowed him with wisdom. <clears throat> and no one, no one aside from Jesus Christ uh, had his wisdom. So the purpose of these Proverbs is in verse 2. To know wisdom and instruction. To perceive the words of understanding. In other words, the clues and the keys to help you as you try to read your Bible and understand it. To receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, and judgment, and equity. To give subtlety to the simple and to the young man knowledge and discretion. This is something severely lacking in all of the public school systems that are in America. They're no longer teaching the necessities, the requirements, math, science, history. My goodness, they ought to be teaching history on college campuses instead of let's, let's, uh, let's protest Israel and let's, let's ask for the... the um, the destruction of the Jewish race. Because on college campuses, when they raise those signs that say, from the rivers to the sea, that's exactly what that means. The extermination of the Jewish race. And for what reason? They don't know. Their professors and whoever else is encouraging them with money, they're just going out and protesting. Oh, they want to go down in history. Like the hippies back in the 1960s. Uh, 60s and early 70s. They think, oh, this is our time now to protest and to make changes in the world. They have no idea what they're doing. But to give young men knowledge and discretion, that is the job of fathers and grandfathers all over the world. A wise man will hear and will increase learning. I don't care how old you get, how old you are. You're not done learning. And don't ever think that. As long as this Bible's got wisdom in it that you haven't, you haven't attained to, as long as there's questions still in your mind about what's right and what's wrong, and as long as there's questions in your mind uh, about issues of life that, that pertain to you and to your family, then you've got some things to learn, my friend. A wise man will hear and will increase in learning, and a man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsels. So right here, we have the... Uh, 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 sort of the, uh, the call out to all of the men, all of the grandpas, all of the dads, all of the men of our church. You've heard me mention several times how I believe that I want every adult in this church to be a role model for the young people that are in this church. In my lifetime, I had good role models and there were men that I picked that I really looked up to that, sad to say, fell far short of the things that I needed as a young man. And so my encouragement, number one, God's calling on my life is to be that example uh, God's calling on your life is to be that same example, whether you have your children here, whether you have your grandchildren here, or whether you're not. There's, a, there's a Brother Roy out there. He, his, him and his wife, they never did have any children, but he considers every child in this church his grandchild. 
They run up to him. They get hugs. He gives hugs back. I'll go sit down. I'm talking nice about you. I don't want you to hear it when I'm talking nice about you. He loves the children of this church. He doesn't want anything to happen to them. He doesn't want anything bad to happen to them. And he wants a church where the children in this church can feel safe, amen. Safe from whatever's going on in the world. You know, we got children in this church that are being raised in multiple families, multiple homes. And while we try to, when they're with us, we try to give them as much as uh, God's love and God's teaching and God's wisdom and the things that we've learned, we try to give them as much as we can uh, from the things that God has blessed us with. But then they're going into homes, and I'm sad to say I have no idea what's going on in these homes. I don't know what they're allowed to see on their tablets or their phones or their TVs. I don't know... I don't know who they're allowed to play with. I don't know what books they're allowed to read. I don't know what movies they're allowed to see. And so it is our responsibility, number one, to learn this wisdom and to learn this knowledge so that we can pass it on. Now, turn to uh, look at verse uh, 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of of the knowledge. Um, I, won't, I won't go there, but Isaiah chapter 11 uh, tells us all the uh, seven spirits of God. And uh, they start out in verse 2, the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom. Well, the spirit of the Lord is number one, the spirit of wisdom is number two, and understanding, that's three, the spirit of counsel, and uh, the spirit of might, that's four and five, the spirit of knowledge, that's six, and the fear of the Lord. And I'm, where this sermon is going to end up is going to deal with chastening. Now who knows what chastening is? What is it? They have different names. You can say whoopings. It's correction. It's, it's more than correction. Okay? Correction with a stinger. Okay? Uh, now, the Bible does not teach child abuse. In fact, the Bible warns against it. Paul said, fathers, provoke not your children to anger. You can whip your children or your grandchildren with a wrong attitude, a bad attitude, or in the wrong way, or too hard. And that could be borderline abuse. But let me say this to you. It is not against the law in Missouri for you to use corporal punishment on your children. Do not let anybody scare you into believing that. Somebody say amen. The fear of the Lord. I've learned the fear of the Lord over and over and over in my lifetime. Now, this is one of the spirits of God that's in me. And that spirit of God teaches me that if I get out of line and no one else knows it, so there's no one else to chew me out for it, no one else to come after me for it, I know the one who knows everything that I did, and his name is God, and he is my father. And if my father thinks I've gone too far, then my Father will put into me the fear of the Lord. There are things that I want to do that I don't do anymore. And the reason why I don't do them anymore is I am afraid of what God will do to me if I do it. Amen. You raise your hand. Amen. Clap your hands. Give God a hand. Give Him a shout. Go woo-hoo. Amen. So look at this. Proverbs 1 Verse 7, the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. You must teach them. Listen, if you will not teach your children a respectful fear of you as their parent, they will never fear the Lord. They'll never do it. Outside of God's grace, they'll never do it. So the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. But fools despise wisdom and instruction. You know what fools are, aren't you? Fools are the people that you invite to church. You invite them and they say, I don't go to no church. I don't want no preacher telling me how to live my life. 
Ain't nothing wrong with my life. I'd do enough good deeds that if I believed in God, I'd go to heaven straight through. No doubt about it. They don't know anything. They're foolish because they don't know the way of life. They don't know the way of salvation. They don't know that Jesus died for their sins. They don't even know that they've sinned against God. Or they've denied that they've sinned against God. Just fools will despise wisdom and instruction. Fools will not want to come and hear a sermon like this. They'll think, I don't need no teaching on anything. I know how to raise my kids. I know how to, they're my kids. I'll raise them how I want to and how I want to. And let me tell you something. That's the reason why we have the youth problems that we have in this country today. Not only do you, you know what, I, I saw something in Hillsboro that just hit me as absolutely stupid. You go through Hillsboro on Old 21, and on the right now, they've got this new marijuana store called North. Right across the street from it is the Drug Rehabilitation Center. Yeah, that sounds about right, doesn't it? Verse 8, now this is father's, this is yours. My son, hear the instruction of thy father, and forsake not the law of thy mother. Isn't, it, isn't that amazing? God, God knew this, Solomon knew it, that dads are the teachers, but moms lay down the law. Amen. For they shall be an ornament of grace unto thy head and chains about thy neck. My son, this is what fathers. Now dads, look up at me for a minute. Dads and grandpas. All of us men, we know what it's like to be men. My, uh, you pray for me. I got an issue with my neighbor. Uh... Michaela came out to the house the other day, wanted to shoot guns, so we were out in the backyard shooting guns. It was about 7 o'clock, something like that at night. And my neighbor came out and gave me a cussing like you wouldn't believe. He said him and his wife got up at 2.30 in the morning. Well, I didn't know that. And there's no way in the world, had I known that, that I would have been out there doing that. But, I mean, he cussed me up one side, down the other. Me standing there holding a gun. And uh, I held my tongue. Part of that is because I've worked in construction. And I know how men talk. And I know how men butt heads every now and then. And uh, there's a lot of yelling and screaming going on and shaking because you're ready to either run or you're ready, your body's got adrenaline in it. And you're ready to either hit somebody or you're ready to run. So I've been out in the world. And I know what it's like. I know the temptations that befall us men. But it's our responsibility then to take our children and our grandchildren and sit down with them and say, look at verse 10, my son. If sinners entice thee, consent thou not. You know, we raise our children in a, in a home where we want to protect them from everything. I don't, I don't totally agree with that. I think just like the body gets used to certain germs that are out there and builds up defenses to it, I think our children need to build up defenses about things that are in the world while they are in our homes. Can I hear you? understand what I'm saying to you? Okay? They're going to hear things out there from other people. It's best if they hear them while they're under your control. That way you can sit them down and say, Now, do you remember what so-and-so did? Remember what so-and-so said? Don't do that. Don't follow after his ways. That's not the way to go. Okay, and there, and there are times, listen to me, when I think you should share with your children, your grandchildren, whatever, 
some of the mistakes that you made in days gone past. They may think that, well, my dad's never done nothing wrong. My grandpa's never done nothing wrong. Yeah, you have, and you know it. And as you sit down with them, my son of sinners entice thee, consent thou not. Tell them why they shouldn't go after them, because you did at one time, and tell them what it cost you. Amen? Verse 11, if they say, come with us and let us lay wait for blood, let us lurk privily for the innocent without cause, let us swallow them up alive as the grave. That sounds like something that is describing the lyrics of a rap song nowadays. Verse 13, we shall find all precious substance. We shall fill our houses with spoil. Cast in thy lot among us. Let us all have one purse. I want you to underline that phrase in your Bible. Let us all have one purse. Do you know what that is in political science terms? Socialism, communism. Where they say, when you hear politicians talk about... Um, Wage equality. Don't fall for that. Don't fall for it. It's saying that we're going to take the person who's making a low income, we're going to raise them up on the basis of no merit whatsoever, and then we're going to take the person who makes the high income, we're going to reduce him down to the same level. What then is the incentive for the man of low wage to work because he's going to get paid more for doing nothing. What then is the incentive for the, for the genius of the company who's coming up with all the good ideas? What incentive is there for him to be um, progressive in his research and his diligence? Because he's being brought down to a lower wage. And he's going, if they don't have to work and get paid, then I don't have to work and get paid. I'm telling you, it doesn't work. I told my son Matthew when he joined the Carpenters Union. I'm not necessarily against working in a union. Everybody's got to work a job. Everybody's got to earn a wage. And if that's how they want to do it, that's fine. But I told him, son, don't let them tell you how to vote. Don't let them tell you how to vote. Um, let us, uh, verse uh, 14... Cast in thy lot among us, let us all have one purse. My son, walk not thou in the way with them. Refrain thy foot from their path, for their feet run to evil and make haste to shed blood. Let me tell you something, parents. It is not the school's job to teach your children morality. This is Pride Month. You don't want your school teacher teaching your children about how great a lifestyle that is. It's not a great lifestyle. Those of you who remember Tim Barron's, comes here every now and then. He lives in Las Vegas, Nevada. His goal is to hand out 300 gospel tracts a day, every single day. He said his most effective ministry is going into the gay bars in Las Vegas. And he's got a card in there that's got a website called... Um, uh, freefilms.com or something like that but on there is a video about suicide and he always goes to the bartender and he says to the bartender uh, sir can I have your picture he said do you have people in here that are contemplating suicide and he says the bartender will go take your pick Tim told me he said those are the most saddest places that you can go into and he said he'll go around from table to table and ask them, would you like to watch a video on suicide that it might help you? Almost every time they'll take that card and he'll say just go to you know, freefilms.com and, and watch that video there because it has the gospel on it. That's, that lifestyle is against nature, which means it's against the way God built us to think. And there is no happiness in it. There's nothing but sadness. There's nothing but guilt. There's nothing but wanting and not being able to have. My son, if thou, uh, Proverbs chapter 2, my son, if thou wilt receive my words and hide my commandments with thee, 
so that thou incline thine ear unto wisdom and apply thine heart to understanding. Yea, if thou criest after knowledge and liftest up thy voice for understanding, if thou seekest for her as silver and searchest for her as for hid treasures, then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord. There it is again, the fear of the Lord. And find the knowledge of God. For the Lord giveth wisdom, and out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. You know what you're teaching your children to do? You're teaching your children that the questions that they are going to have throughout their life can all be answered by God's word. All of them what are you going to do <clears throat> when your child graduates high school whether you homeschooled them or you put them in public school but you tried to teach them the right ways of God what are you going to do when your child gets into the university and they immediately start putting pressure on them to believe in evolution to believe that we came from a lower life form to believe that there is no God to believe that we were not created to be unique in God's eyes. What are you going to do for your children when they come home with questions that you can't answer? Because you didn't bother to study it. You didn't think it was important. Let me tell you something. Right now, one of the most important things that I would learn from this Bible is not only how we were created, but why we were created, and learn some of the things in the Word of God that pertain to the creation. Because all that, and this happened to a friend of mine. We went to Twin City Christian Academy together. <clears throat> then uh, I went to public school. He followed a year behind me. We were still close friends all through high school. He went over to Second Baptist Church. I went over here. We were, we were two Christian young men going to school together. Uh, the, the first time we hooked up, after we got into college, he went to a university in Arkansas. I went to Bible college. The first time that we hooked up together, I could see there was a difference in his appearance. He had on these little John Lennon glasses, and he had his hair combed differently and things like that. And I remember talking to him. And he said, Mike, I'll be honest with you. He said, I just, I don't even believe in the existence of God anymore. He said, I'm taking a philosophy course. Destroyed his faith. And, you know, I, I, I found him on Facebook and friended him several years ago. And, you know, he's still that way. He hasn't changed a bit. Is he lost forever? I hope not. But somebody didn't teach him the things that he needed to learn. I'm not blaming his parents. He had good parents. But then thou shalt, in verse 5, thou shalt understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord giveth wisdom, and out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. Look down in verse 10. Here's what happens when you will let wisdom into your heart. When wisdom entereth into thine heart, and knowledge is pleasant unto thy soul. Discretion shall preserve thee. Your children are going to grow up and they're going to face the problems that you've faced. They're going to make the mistakes that you made that you don't want your children to make. But more than likely, they're going to make them. And in some cases, they're going to do it worse than you did. And I'm here to tell you as a parent, that's hard to take. Because you know that in their failures, it's a response to your own failures. And you cry to God and you plead to God and say, God, if I hadn't done this, would they have done that? I don't know that I've ever gotten an answer to that. But I don't like seeing my children, or anybody else's children for that matter, make some of the same mistakes that we make. We would want to teach them and train them 
so that wisdom enters their heart and discretion preserves them. I'll, I'll say this, is it possible in today's world that at least one of the children that we have in this church could end up in prison? Is that possible? You bet it is. You bet it is. Don't deny it. And don't be the one who sees your children as the little saints. Let me tell you, they're not saints. They're all devils, every one of them. You brought them into this world. They are devils, for sure. But if they had discretion, discretion would have kept them from making the mistakes that cost them years of their life spent in prison. Understanding shall keep thee to deliver thee from the way of the evil man, from the man that speaketh froward things, who leave the paths of uprightness to walk in the ways of darkness. Isn't it something that some of the most nasty, vilest, disgusting human beings in this country to ever live end up being children's idols? Who knows anything about Snoop Dogg? Not Snoopy the dog from Charlie Brown. Listen, the guy's a whoremonger. All of his videos and his songs were violent and disgusting descriptions of his escapades with women. His years spent on drugs and alcohol. The fact that he himself said in an interview that he sold his soul to the devil to get where he is. And now you can go over here to Walmart and see his name on products all over there. Some of them for children. Where did our children, where did we come to in this country where we took the vilest, most disgusting man that we could find and made him somebody for children to look up to? What have we gotten to in this nation? Deliver thee from the way of the evil man, from the man that speaketh froward things, who leave the paths of uprightness to walk in the ways of darkness, who rejoice to do evil and delight in the frowardness of the wicked. There was a time when young people in church wanted to be like people in the Bible like Moses and Noah and Samson and David. I think we lost something when we got rid of flannel graph, Melissa. Who remembers flannel graph? Yeah! That was the 70s version of PowerPoint. For those of you who don't know what it is, it was like a felt cloth on a board and they had all these little cut out characters that had a little thing on the back that just stuck to the felt, the, flan the flannel. And uh, the teacher would teach the lesson and sometimes move the little things around, you know. But you had Joseph there and you had the Daniel in the lion's den, had things like that. There was a time when Daniel was my hero, Samson was my hero. But now the heroes of today rejoice to do evil. Proverbs chapter 2, verse 16. The words that parents should have are to deliver thee from the strange woman. Moms and dads, warn your sons, don't marry certain types of people. How about an amen? Warn your children, warn your son, don't marry this girl. She's bad news. She's trouble. Stay away from her. Well, they might get mad. Listen, if you don't say something, you will regret it. But if you say something and they get mad, there's nothing to regret. You said, you warned them, 
and they didn't listen. But you warned them. To deliver thee from the strange woman, even from the stranger which flattereth with her words, which forsaketh the guide of her youth, and forgetteth the covenant of her God. Let me tell you something, parents. The devil has a woman or a man out there already prepared for your son or your daughter to steal them away. And I will say this, and I've seen it, I have seen it with my own eyes. In some cases, for your daughter, the devil has another girl out there for your daughter to steal her away. Another man out there to steal your little boy away. Isn't that the world that we live in? Verse 18, for her house inclineth unto death and her paths unto the dead. None that go unto her return again, neither take they hold of the paths of life, that thou mayest walk in the way of good men and keep the paths of righteous. For the upright shall dwell in the land and the perfect shall remain in it, but the wicked shall be cut off from the earth and the transgressors shall be rooted out. God very clearly is saying to you, young people, that if you grow up, and you turn your heart against God, God will root you out. He will destroy you because you're a transgressor. And yet God will bless the ways of those who are righteous and those who teach righteousness to their children. Can I hear you say amen? Let me move down the road here. Turn to Proverbs 3. Proverbs 3, verse 11. Now I'm going to say to everybody... Sitting here and everybody listening, I love you. My children are here. And if you want to ask any of them, did I ever abuse them? You're more than welcome to ask. Matthew, did I ever abuse you? No, never. Did I ever whip you? Yeah. Did you have it coming? Yeah. Ask my mother if she ever abused me and my sister. There was the one time with the broom. I remember that. Yeah. But to all my kids and grandkids, don't worry. She's an old woman who's trying to get to heaven now. So there's nothing to fear, all right? Let me tell you what the devil has robbed out of this generation of parents. They've robbed chastening their children. They've robbed it from them. Parents, instead of applying chastening and the rod to their children, would rather yell at them, curse at them, or just leave them be. And, the, and here's the thing. Most of the parents, a lot of the parents, I won't say most of them. Where is their children going to learn to drink alcohol from? By getting into mom and dad's liquor cabinet. Where is the children going to get their first taste of marijuana? Mom and dad. Because they bought it from the north store. The problem is, you've got parents now doing drugs, alcohol, and they're not, and it's not just marijuana. Anybody says marijuana is not a, um, a gateway drug, who knows better? It's not a gateway drug. I mean, it is a gateway drug. Because you get high and you get high and you get tired of that and they say, well, we got something better here. And now you're on crack, you're on cocaine. Or worse, you're on meth. Or worse, you're on heroin. Or worse, you're on fentanyl. And fentanyl, even the cops now are starting to wear protective gear against just a whiff of fentanyl being in the air, it's enough to kill them. This is a dangerous world that we live in, and the drugs are everywhere. They're not just in the poor neighborhoods anymore. 
They're in the middle class. They're in the, the rich neighborhoods. They are everywhere. And they do nothing but kill and destroy. Proverbs 3.11. My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord. Now, here's my argument for parental use of corporal punishment. If God says, I'm going to do it to my children, then we likewise do it to our children. The Bible says, and I don't have these verses here, but the Bible says you, will, you can teach them to stay away from hell itself by chastening your children. You know why? You're telling them that for wrong actions, there is going to be severe pain. Now, God designed a part of our body that has a lot of fat to it, no vital organs or bones whatsoever, and a billion nerve endings. Amen? So that when it is struck, it stings. And they rub. Or you got these children nowadays who think that putting their hands back there is a better idea. It's not. You're just going to get your hands slapped. But listen, I'm, I'm not in favor of child abuse and I preach against it. But I am in favor of correcting children. My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, neither be weary of his correction. For whom the Lord loveth, he correcteth, even as the father, the son, in whom he delighteth. When you love your children, you will correct them. You know why you will correct them? You don't want them to turn out like Charles Manson. You don't want them to turn out like Snoop Dogg. You don't want them to turn out the way the neighbor's kids are turned out. They're getting in trouble by the law all the time. They're in prison. They're in juvenile. You don't want your children to turn out this way. You want your children to turn out right and decent, hardworking people that know what's right and what's wrong. They know this gender fluidness is nonsense. And they know who to vote for president. Amen. So Job says in chapter 5, verse 17, Behold, happy is the man whom God corrected. How many of you have been corrected by God? Raise your hand. Hi, raise it high. Aren't you glad? I am. Very glad. Happy is the man whom God correcteth. Therefore despise not thou the chastening of the Almighty. For he maketh sore and he bindeth up. He woundeth, and his hands make whole. See, it's love. You swat your child or use a rod against your child, and then you take them, and you draw them in, and you hold them and say, I didn't want to do that, but I had to because I love you. Now, let me just hold you for a while so you know that I love you and I'll make it feel all better. That's what a good dad does. That's what a good grandpa does. Turn to Hebrews chapter 12. There's a word here. Some of you may not know this. You might be surprised that it's in your Bible. We use it as a curse word. And it's true because it is a curse word. It is the word bastard. The word bastard is used in the context of that we are sons of God, children of God. And as children of God, then we let God chasten us. Because if we won't let God chasten us, then we can't be his children. God's not raising a bunch of spoiled brats who stomp and snort their way through Walmart in order to get whatever they want. And the parent finally decides, well, it's the only way to get them to shut up. It's your fault. You're the one that did it. You're the one that bought them everything they wanted. 
and they know to play the game that if they don't get what they want, they stomp and snort and scream and cause a big fit. And instead of you dealing with that right there and right then, I'll never forget, Ster Sterling used to tell me how Steve, when he was little, threw a fit in the grocery store one time, and he threw himself down on the floor, and Sterling just started whooping on him right there in the middle of the grocery store aisle. And he whooped him until he got up. And it took a while. Steve's a little stubborn. But he whipped him and whipped him and whipped him until he stood up. And then he was fine after that. Um, look at Hebrews chapter 12 and we'll close with this. Verse 5. You have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord. That's what we just read. As a Christian, if you've done something wrong... You let God correct you. Because if you don't, you're going to get by with it again. And you're going to keep getting by with it. And then you're going to think that it must be okay because God has let me get away with it. No, it's because God's just about to reject you because you won't let him correct you. Despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. And I'm going to ask you parents this morning, do you really love your children? Do you really love them? If you do, you will whoop the fire out of them. You'll go out and you'll get you a switch off a willow tree and you'll make it sting. That's not child abuse. That's correction. You're keeping your children from being liberals. Amen? Verse 7, If you endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? But if you be without chastisement, wherefore all are partakers, here, here it is, then are ye bastards and not sons. And what that means is, if you are not the son of the father, when the father is ready to give the inheritance out, you are not on the list. Because you are not God's son. And heaven is our inheritance. The Bible says that we are joint heirs with Jesus Christ. Amen? Did Christ suffer? Yes, but he didn't suffer for sins. So if he suffered and he receives glory for everlasting, then why wouldn't it be okay if when we do something wrong, God chastens us and we suffer for a short time, then we can receive those same glory, that same glory forever with Jesus. Because if you won't be chastened and so, listen, whatever God has to do to you to get you to open your eyes is far better than put you in the lake of fire for eternity. Verse 8, but if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh, which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits, meaning God, and live? For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure. But he meaning God, for our prophet. That we might be partakers of his holiness. Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward, it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. 
I'm going to ask you to bow your head this morning. No one looking around. Michael's going to zoom the camera on me so you not be seen. I'm going to ask all you men out there. I mean, if you got things in your life, I don't need to know what they are, that you can't, you can't stop doing them, but you want them gone. And you want God to get rid of them. Would you raise your hand? I raise my hand. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. The remedy is God treating you like a son. If my son kept doing the same things over and over again, then what I did was I took my belt off, I laid him across the bed, and I gave him a whooping. I did that so that they would learn not to do that and that they would learn the bigger picture that dad whipping them is nothing compared to what God can do. And so I'm going to pray this morning for all you men out there and all you men online that God truly loves you. You're going to allow God, in fact, sometimes you ask for it. I have. Sometimes I've said, God, you need to get me for that. Don't let me get away with that. And God will take care of you. He still loves you. In fact, the fact that God chastens you is the manifest token of His love. He is teaching you the fear of the Lord. That's what He's teaching you. And that is what you can instill to your children and to your grandchildren. The fear of the Lord. Our Father, come before you this morning. And Lord, to all these men, even to these women, Father, some of them, Lord, are single parents. And I pray, dear God, that you would help each and every one of them. The things of this world, Lord, are, are out and open and available way too easily. Father, I pray, God, that the things of this world that are so accessible to all of our men, to all of our parents, Father, that the fight now would be on. They would fight in war and labor against the principalities and the powers and the rulers of the darkness and the spiritual wickedness that haunts them, that, that tries to destroy them and destroy their ruling over their families. And Father, I pray, dear God, that you would take these men, these women, Lord, that you love, and for the things, God, that they're doing wrong, myself included, God, that you would chasten them. And don't let us, Father, don't let us think that some of the things that we do, that we can get by with doing them. Things that you said specifically in your word, thou shalt not. Father, don't let us think we can get by with anything. Because we don't want to raise our children that way. We want them to know that if they do things that are wrong, they're going to get caught. 
and now they have you to fear. But Father, I have found that having you to fear is a lot more gracious to me than fearing what man would do to me. And so, Lord, always I fall upon your grace. And yes, Lord, I know you'll forgive me. I know that you'll wipe away my transgressions. But I also know that you will chasten this flesh of mine so that it never wants to do those things again. And the next time the temptation comes up, we think twice before we do it. Father, I pray to your God that you would bless our men, help us to build strong men in this church that pass down, Lord, to the younger generation in this church the things, God, that you have helped them with, the grace, Lord, that you've manifested in their lives. Even, Father, some of the things that, you've, that they've done wrong, God, that they would pass down to that younger generation the mistakes they made. Begging, begging the younger generation, please, don't do what I did. Don't fall into the trap that I fell into. You may not make it back. Father, we love you. We pray, dear God, that you would go with us this week, each and every one. Lord, that you would go and give us traveling mercy and safety, Lord, as we depart this place. Bless all of these young people. Bless all these adults, Lord, that are going. Watch over my church, Lord, in my absence. Dismiss us now in your care, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. If you stand up this morning like Jaden did, look at him. Are you ready to go, Jaden?